view of the people. The traditional way to address the king is something like, uh, I am the dust under your foot, you know, and you are the master of my existence. And, and all that uh, kind of uh, way of speaking was, was really meaning something. Two years later, in 1955, Sihanouk once again demonstrated his aptitude for politics. He abdicated as king in favor of his father, taking instead the title of prince. To Cambodians, he became affectionately known as Prince Papa. Sihanouk then formed his own political party and promptly won all the seats in the country's first election. Was uh, really changeable. He changed his mind uh, easily, and uh, he has uh, the character of uh, a Machiavellian, Machiavellian prince. You see? Uh, he, uh, in the Cold War era, he was trying to uh, you know, uh, play off one power against another. Cambodia had emerged as an independent nation in a troubled region. Neighboring Vietnam was already divided into two parts, a communist north and a nominally democratic south, and they were already at war. President Eisenhower's Secretary of State, John Foster Dulles, told the young prince that all countries, even new ones, had to choose sides in the war against communism. Your neutrality is uh, foolish, uh, Foster Dulles told me. Uh, we, in, in our world, you have to choose between the free world and the communist world. And please choose. Don't say that you are neutral. I say, I repeat that I am neutral. Cambodia itself had a sizable Vietnamese population, but centuries of antagonism had created a legacy of deep-seated distrust between the two peoples. The last thing the new country wanted was to become embroiled in the Vietnam War. But the Cold War had made playing the role of a neutral nation extremely dangerous. From 1961 on, U.S. Presidents Kennedy and Johnson gradually increased American military involvement in South Vietnam. Early on, Sihanouk predicted how this conflict would end. He was quite convinced that the Americans, like the French, would lose the war in Vietnam, and that that would leave Cambodia exposed to uh, the, the wrath of the communist countries and to Vietnam once the Americans moved out of the area. Sihanouk made it clear to the Americans that their interference was not welcome in Southeast Asia. In 1965, the United States responded by closing its embassy in Phnom Penh. Sihanouk began courting a powerful new friend. He was leaning further and further toward the uh, socialist camp, especially toward China, you see? And then uh, uh, China uh, uh, had begun uh, uh, its assistance, uh, uh, economic assistance, and then increase uh, its assistance afterwards, you see? By the early 1960s, the political map of the world had been dramatically transformed. The worldwide decline of colonialism had given rise to dozens of newly independent nations in Asia and Africa. But these countries were often opposed to U.S. foreign policy at the United Nations and elsewhere. The United States decided it would set its own agenda in Vietnam. By early 1966, the United States had 190,000 troops in South Vietnam. Increasingly, communists and communist supporters sought sanctuary across the border in neutral Cambodia. Sihanouk grew increasingly worried that Cambodia would be caught up in the war. He was scared of the Vietnamese, and he felt that the only way he could uh, alleviate what, uh, or lessen what the Vietnamese might do to Cambodia when and if they won the war, he was pretty sure they would win the war, was to make deals with them and to ally himself with them in order to save his own uh, regime, uh, save Cambodia's independence, and so on. He was, uh, he was supping with the devil, but what else could he have done? I do not have 
the, the United States, but by opportunism, by patriotism. I had to help the North Vietnamese, and I got their permission to respect always Cambodia as an independent state, a neutral state, non-aligned state, without any interference in our internal affairs from Vietnam. Both sides in the Cold War were raising the stakes in Vietnam. The Soviet Union and China were increasing their flow of arms and ammunition to the communist forces. Reassured by his relationship with the Chinese, Sihanouk now took a major risk. He would let them transport supplies and weapons through Cambodia. We saw the uh, Viet Cong there and North Vietnamese troops move in. Uh, but the number at that time is not many. No, they are very good friends with the people, you know. They come and help people like uh, plants dry, harvesting, carry water and all that. Yeah, they are very good. Probably they train to be good uh, discipline and be friendship with the people. Using Cambodia's neutrality as protection, the Viet Cong and North Vietnamese were attacking and killing Americans in South Vietnam. Infuriated, the United States military formulated a plan to attack the Vietnamese sanctuaries in Cambodia. My advice to Washington was not to take military action against Cambodia, not to bring the war to Cambodia, not to invade Cambodia, not to try to get rid of Sihanouk. Since the closure of the American embassy, the Australian ambassador, Noel Deschamps, was acting as the representative of the United States in Cambodia. I believe that if any of these things were done, it would bring disaster to Cambodia without in any way helping the United States win the war. And in fact, uh, for the whole four years of Johnson's presidency, that advice was followed. Lyndon Johnson had steadfastly refused to allow the US military to enter Cambodia. Despite the presence of the North Vietnamese, he still considered it a neutral country. But American policy would change with the election of a new president. In late 1968, America elected Richard Nixon president. He campaigned on the pledge to end US involvement in the Vietnam War. In consultation with his newly appointed national security advisor, Henry Kissinger, Nixon adopted the American military's plan to destroy the North Vietnamese sanctuaries in Cambodia. In March 1969, just eight weeks after coming to office, Nixon gave the order to begin a covert bombing campaign in Cambodia. I was one of the first civilian to learn about the bombing of Cambodia. It was early March 1969. I wandered into the photo interpretation shop of Mac V, and an enlisted man who was a photo interpreter said, hey, come on over here and take a look at this. He says, we have a track here. We tried to bomb the, fr the headquarters of the 1st North Vietnamese Army Division, which was seven kilometers inside Cambodia. Well, I was absolutely astonished and appalled. I said, we did what? Because it was absolutely against our policy to bomb Cambodia. The bombing raids over Cambodia would be cloaked in the deepest secrecy. The White House knew they could be regarded as an act of war against a neutral country. Air Force records were altered so that all traces of the bombing of Cambodia were eliminated. I guess they uh, felt in large measure it could be justified that the communist side had violated Cambodia's neutrality and they were fair game that when the truth uh, came out eventually, they might be able to justify it. Later, Kissinger would defend the action. Uh, Cambodia was embroiled. It is an absurdity to say that a country can occupy a part of another country, kill your people, 
and that then you are violating its neutrality when you respond against the foreign troops that are on that neutral territory. Well, it is I total will... hypocrisy. For his part, Sihanouk took a pragmatic view of the situation. Just three months after the secret bombing campaign began, full diplomatic relations between Cambodia and the United States were re-established. The quid pro quo for reopening diplomatic uh, relations with uh, Cambodia would have to have been the secret bombing. It seems to me that Sihanouk uh, knew about the secret bombing, gave, and, and he's made many statements more or less to this effect, that he gave the Americans permission to bomb uh, his, uh, his Cambodian territory. Sihanouk had expected a massive injection of American aid. This failed to materialize. Sihanouk was struggling. The fact that he wasn't delivering economically, that Cambodia was slipping backwards quite rapidly, uh, was building a lot of resentment at home. Firstly, in the army, he didn't have enough to actually give uniforms to the army or pay them properly. Uh, they felt belittled. Um, secondly, with the student population especially, because they didn't get jobs. There is the feeling, this, this strong feeling of, of longing for change, longing to take on responsibility by yourself, it pervading the, the, you know, the community in the capital city, particularly in Phnom Penh. For the first time in March 1970, while Sihanouk was traveling overseas, there were public demonstrations against the prince's rule. Events came to a head on the 18th of March. Lon Nol, Sihanouk's hand-picked prime minister and a general in the Cambodian army, led a coup that overthrew the prince. Lon Nol uh, had been a confidant of U.S. officials uh, in the military and uh, among civilians. They had been in close contact with him for a long time. Uh, they, they had, had, had offered support to him, and he had, he had asked for support. There were all kinds of connections. There's no smoking gun in the, in the sense of the U.S. saying explicitly to Lano, you go and overthrow Sihanouk. But the, the circumstantial evidence is quite uh, extensive. Obviously, he, he had American backing. Because he, he, he was not a person who would have staged a coup d'etat with our, unless he'd had some kind of assurances from somewhere, and where else? The overthrow of Sihanouk in March 1970 is the absolute turning point for Cambodia's destiny. Up until then, uh, it, was, it was going downhill. Uh, life uh, was not what all Cambodians wanted by a long shot, but it was basically at peace. From then on, it was downhill. For Sihanouk, a descendant of the ancient Cambodian kings, being deposed by his subjects was incomprehensible. He could never relinquish control over his Cambodia. Sihanouk reacted in a way that would have unforeseeable and horrific consequences. Taking up a Chinese offer of assistance, Sihanouk was persuaded to form a government in exile, known as the National United Front of Kampuchea. He immediately broadcast an impassioned declaration of war, calling for the Cambodian people to take arms against the Lon Nol government. During that time, a lot of argument between people in the village, students, ordinary people, teacher, monk, uh, government employee and all that about what's called the, at that time, the coup d'etat. And some uh, support Lonol and some support uh, King. Sihanouk's united front not only included the North Vietnamese, but also the little known Cambodian Communist Party, the Khmer Rouge. In March 1970, Pol Pot's Khmer Rouge were nothing. Uh, Sihanouk had seen to it that way. He had undermined the communist side. Uh, this was very astute politics. Uh, we can, we can criticise Sihanouk for all sorts of things, but he totally compromised the Cambodian communist movement, mainly by his alliance with China. They wouldn't back the Cambodian communists. Uh, they were a, a piddling little force. 
For the Khmer Rouge, this was a first step towards power. As Sihanouk's call to arms electrified the countryside, thousands of peasants joined the communists to help Sihanouk drive out the Lon Nol government and its American allies. When Sihanouk decided to form this united front, it gave them an alliance with the Vietnamese. It openly aligned with Sihanouk. This gave them access to arms, training, uh, uh, personnel, all sorts of stuff that they had not had before. Uh, but over the next two or three years, they develop into an efficient, uh, well-armed, uh, uh, pretty large uh, 40, 50,000 men uh, fighting force. Uh, that could not have been done without this. It, it all flowed from that alliance, which, which flowed from the coup. While Sihanouk was rallying the countryside, La Nol was building support in the cities for the expulsion of the Vietnamese from Cambodia. In some instances, atrocities were committed against Vietnamese who had lived in Cambodia for generations. While thousands of innocent Vietnamese were killed, ancient traditions of warfare would dictate a more gruesome fate for enemy soldiers. When we had film of Cambodians cutting open uh, bodies and ripping out the liver and eating them, Western opinion was pretty shocked by the Lon Nol forces doing that. But this is what Cambodians are doing, were doing by tradition. Uh, it is uh, said that it's getting the spirit, the strength of your enemy. Uh, it's a, a ritual. Quite frequently in the early years of the war, as a mark of friendship, they would ask you to come and join them in eating the liver of, of uh, the dead. On April 30th, just six weeks after the coup against Sihanouk, American and South Vietnamese troops crossed Cambodia's eastern frontier. In cooperation with the armed forces of South Vietnam, attacks are being launched this week to clean out major enemy sanctuaries on the Cambodian-Vietnam border. The purpose was to destroy the communist headquarters that the American military believed must be coordinating the war in South Vietnam. We take this action not for the purpose of expanding the war into Cambodia, but for the purpose of ending the war in Vietnam. Nixon was convinced that with the communist control center destroyed, South Vietnam's security could be assured. The United States could declare victory and then complete its planned withdrawal of U.S. troops. This is not an invasion of Cambodia. I know that the uh, gun and artillery and selling, you know, they don't know you are innocent people or you are the Viet Cong, you know, they kill everyone. Into my village, uh, my neighbor house were burning and killed the people, injured the people, but uh, you can do nothing. <laughs> ອັນນີ້ກໍຕູ້ຈຶ່ງຍົ້ມມາໃຫຍ່ລົດຢືດເປັ້ຍຍົ້ມປະແລງໃຫຍ່ລົດເຕີ້ລົດຊຸມວ
I can now state that this has been the most successful operation of this long and very difficult war. I frankly think that Nixon was quite courageous in taking that action. And I know it was not the popular thing to do. It's not even popular for me to say it here 30 years later. But it, uh, he was protecting American forces, and uh, it worked. In fact, U.S. troops never found any communist headquarters in Cambodia. I think the Americans were deluded a bit about this idea of a central military headquarters. And of course, the Vietnamese never had such a, a thing where they would centralize everything. They, they were working in the kind of networking of commanding places and moving all the time. In the United States, Nixon's policies were causing grave concern. A growing number in Congress felt something needed to be done. As to stopping the use of our own forces, we can do it by prohibiting the use of funds, by denying funds. That's the constitutional authority we have. Even though the American military withdrew after 60 days, Congress passed legislation prohibiting further use of U.S. ground forces in Cambodia. This was the first time Congress had restricted the military authority of a U.S. president during wartime. Nixon's decision to invade Cambodia had engulfed the country in war. The Americans made a mistake. They were pushing, uh, forcing the uh, Northern Viet Cong troops to move quick inside the country. Once the, the Allied forces came charging across, they just swept the Vietnamese deeper into Cambodia and spread the war, spread it uh, to Cambodia's uh, great sorrow. The Americans failed to realize that their invasion would unleash a wave of brutality and violence directed at Cambodian villagers by the South Vietnamese military. ໃນນັ້ນກໍມີແດ່ວ່າທີ່ກີຄ້າຈ້ະສະຫາຍຈຶ່ງຢຶກກອງ <coughs> Pushed ever deeper into Cambodian territory by the Americans and their South Vietnamese allies, the North Vietnamese, Viet Cong, and Khmer Rouge launched an offensive against Lon Nol's forces. This is a country uh, which is defending its sovereignty against outside aggression. Emery Kobe Swank was the first American ambassador to Cambodia since the re-establishment of diplomatic ties. They have asked for our help, and I think it is a part of what we are calling the Nixon Doctrine, that we help people help themselves, help people to defend themselves. That's what the program here is all about. Cambodia is the Nixon Doctrine in its purest form. Because in Cambodia, what we are doing is helping the Cambodians to help themselves. Nixon called it the Nixon Doctrine in its purest form because uh, you can read it two ways. I mean, it's either the darkest way to read it is that America had no stake in a place where there was no American lives at risk and no American interests at stake. That's a dark reading. A positive reading is we weren't paying any costs for something that was helpful to us in, in our Vietnam War. Here we are in the middle of a war with Vietnam, one that was not clearly defined. We're not sure what we're doing there. Nixon comes in and decides that uh, we're going to have a new Vietnamization program, slowly get peace with honor and bring American troops home. And what do we do? We, we in, engage in an incursion in Laos and Cambodia and do a reckless bombing campaign in which virtually hundreds of thousands of people die at the hands of the United States. The Americans is following the agenda, which is nothing, not necessarily have anything to do with Cambodia's interests. In fact, the American was in disengaging. The American, in fact, is packing up to go home. 
starting from 68. And we did not know that. In fact, we are joining the Vietnam War at the wrong time. Frustrated by Congress's restrictions on the use of ground troops, the Americans stepped up the supply of arms and equipment to Lon Nol's forces. Despite this, they were no match for the battle-hardened North Vietnamese and Viet Cong. When this became clear, the United States responded by intensifying the strategic bombing campaign. The country became a free-fire zone. Despite this massive effort to destroy the communist forces, in fact, very little was known about the membership or motivations of the Khmer Rouge. One of the few journalists who managed to meet them was Serge Thion. It was not yet the real uh, Khmer Rouge uh, kind of iron hand. It was still uh, very nationalistic, very purely anti-American. There was no word of uh, communism or, or social reform or whatever. We met uh, the local village chief and these people were not communists. I mean, they uh, probably had no idea that they were part of a, of a guerrilla that was uh, led by the communists. You know, they, they were uh, looking at the king, at Sihanouk. They felt they were on the good side. They, they felt that they were fighting against the intruders, that these Americans were there, that they, Lonnal and, and this military were mercenaries of the Americans. So they, they thought they were doing this kind of civil war just to regain uh, their freedom and to return to the status uh, before the war. Four years and two months ago, when I first came into this office as president, by far the most difficult problem confronting the nation was the seemingly endless war in Vietnam. In January 1973, delegates to the Paris peace talks announced terms for a formal ceasefire in Vietnam. Tonight, the day we have all worked and prayed for has finally come. However, what appeared to be good news for Vietnam was bad news for Cambodia. The majority of the North Vietnamese and Viet Cong forces withdrew, leaving the Khmer Rouge in charge of 75% of the country. From now on, the conflict would be Cambodian against Cambodia. In support of the Lon Nol government, the United States decided to further intensify the bombing in Cambodia. concentrated all the air force, air power in Asia over Cambodia. So all the B-52s from Guam and so on. And the American embassy in Phnom Penh, they would take the map and, and draw a square and say, OK, obliterate that square. And since their, their intelligence was not very good, they, they didn't know exactly where the, the, the troops were, and they, they bombed the villages away, and they killed an enormous amount of civilians. The bombing was considered by friendly military experts as essential to prevent the loss of the provincial cities that were still controlled by the Lun Nol government. It was really trying to hit a, uh, a fly with a sledgehammer. They would fly out, you know, at 20, 30,000 feet, and um, they would simply um, unload. They had no idea. In some cases, the air crews flying out of Guam didn't even know what they were bombing. <laughs> You blank for a look for home of 
ขยมแล้วกูมาเออขยมกูนอนขยมรถจอดได้ดอกปูให้ตึมเลี้ยดอกปูตึมเลี้ยมาคุยลุงลุงหลังช่วยได้ซะหดจอทองใส่ให้จีรึจีรึให้จังดอกมาได้ดอกปูผักไหลขยมตึมเมื่อไหลตึมเลี้ยให้อัดได้ปันปันจึงไอเขาจะดูดูน้อยจะมาดูพายจังดอกไม้ต้อง I think it's inevitably associated with the bombing. You're always going to hit civilians, particularly if you do it from a great altitude. In August 1973. U.S. warplanes mistakenly bombed Nyak Luang, south of Phnom Penh, killing over 100 civilians. We had a great ceremony in which uh, the United States publicly apologized, and I turned over uh, funds to representatives of the town who uh, came. Of course, you compensating for loss of human life is always uh, uh, unsatisfactory. Mes condoléances personnelles et les condoléances de tout le peuple américain. This six months campaign killed around half a million people. It explains also uh, the. Uh, kind of radicality of the Khmer Rouge because they were under the bombings and they, uh, they remained there. So the survivors were very tough people because they had been through, uh, through hell, really. In March 1973, Sihanouk returned to Cambodia for the first time since his overthrow. He traveled to the forests near Siem Reap, where the Khmer Rouge had set up their headquarters in the overgrown temples of Angkor. His intention was to solidify his leadership of the anti-American alliance. The experience would prove unsettling. He almost got hit by some bombs in, uh, in, when he was there in Simria. Uh, uh, so he comes in in 73, embracing uh, Paul Pot and some of his people in the forest, uh, and says, I'm, I'm your leader, and they kind of hypocritically go along with it for the movie's sake, but it's all very nerve-wracking. I think uh, he, was, he was pretty frightened most of this trip. He could have just uh, had an accident during this trip. But he gets back to Beijing, and then he knows pretty much the jig is up on, on, on taking charge this moment. He's, he's seen the, the real leaders, and he knows these are very strong, pretty ominous people. By using Sihanouk's name to attract recruits, the Khmer Rouge forces had grown from under 3,000 to over 150,000. The bombing had only solidified anti-American sentiment. It was a, a great uh, recruiting thing for the Cambodian communists. People either got so upset about the bombing that they would join the Khmer Rouge to try and have some hope of fighting back, or they deserted the countryside to go to the cities where they felt that they would be a bit safer. So there was a huge refugee uh, flow from the countryside to the cities that made it even harder for the Lon Nol regime to uh, manage the people they had under their control. So Phnom Penh, the capital, for example, went from five or six hundred thousand population to two and a half million. Phnom Penh was full of lots of refugees. The city's infrastructure was completely overwhelmed. Um, there were poor, angry people everywhere. To make matters worse, the Khmer Rouge were nearing the outskirts of the city. This brought the American bombing ever closer to populated areas. <laughs> It became the so-called carpet bombing of Cambodia, um, which l led to widespread devastation. The, the nation of Cambodia, as, as was known before, was becoming non-existent. 
the six months following a ceasefire in the Vietnam War, the Americans dropped more than a quarter of a million tons of bombs on Cambodia, three and a half times the amount dropped on Japan during the Second World War. In his last press conference, Ambassador Swank expressed his disillusionment with the American presence in Cambodia. I said the war has lost meaning. Uh, and I meant any meaning for the United States, uh, which, of course, at that time was at peace, supposedly. In the United States, there was strong sentiment against the continued bombing of Cambodia. Nixon was accused of abusing his presidential power. The President of the United States is not a dictator. At least he's not supposed to be. He's supposed to respond to the expressed will of the Congress in law as passed. By the summer of 1973, Congress had decided that the bombing of Cambodia had to stop. On the 15th of August, 1973, the last American bombs to fall in Southeast Asia exploded around the perimeter of Phnom Penh. The end of the bombing campaign was followed by a gradual decline in American aid to the Lon Nol government. Lon Nol himself was accused of widespread corruption. They also had to survive the lousy leadership of their political leaders and their military leaders, uh, the cowards who would uh, stack the, uh, the, the wages bill with a whole lot of ghost soldiers who didn't exist. They would draw pay for them, pocket the pay, and then when the fight came, they were under strength. They might be thousands under strength. Uh, of course, they would lose. And the ones who were unfortunate enough to be at the battlefront were the heavy losers. Soldiers were very unhappy. They weren't being paid. Uh, they were being sent out to die for what they perceived, quite rightly, as a corrupt authoritarian regime, uh, and were, were reluctant to die for that. Uh, the place was coming apart at the seams. General Dien Del was one of Lon Nol's few effective military commanders. The situation was very bad, and I think we have to change the leadership. Because, uh, as I told you already, that uh, Marshal Lonol cannot uh, direct the country, lead the country. By early 1974, General Dien Del and other senior military figures were prepared to stage a coup in Cambodia. David Whipple was CIA head of station at the time. There was a coup organized by Khmer, our friends, officers, they were going to overthrow the government of, um, of this in, in Phnom Penh. And I had extremely good intelligence on this. But the Americans intervened, preventing the coup and saving the Lon Nol government. Some foreign friends don't like I to do that because uh, not in their interest. Using my local uh, base chief, I s stopped the coup. And the way I stopped the coup was simply to warn the coup plotters that if they did that, that would land them, uh, that would end up very detrimental, not only to them, but to their country and to their whole cause. And persuaded them that they would not get any support from the Americans if they did that. By early 1974, Richard Nixon was engulfed in the Watergate scandal. Charged with widespread abuse of presidential power, Nixon resigned on the 8th of August, 1974. By early 1975, the Khmer Rouge were poised to deliver the final blow to the beleaguered Lon Nol government. Lon Nol departed for exile in Hawaii, never to return to Cambodia. Less than two weeks later, American helicopters arrived unannounced in Phnom Penh. The last remaining Americans and a handful of Cambodians were evacuated from the besieged city. 
David Whipple was on the last helicopter to depart. The Khmer didn't know we were going to do this, and we were embarrassed to do it. And as I took off, I got in this chopper, and there were some military officers in there, American, who had been military attaches and that sort of thing. And I remember one or two sat on either side of me in the thing, and both of them wept because we were letting down the uh, uh, people who are dependent on, depending on us. And you look out the window of the chopper, and you see all these people looking at us perfectly normally. ແລະກອງຕອບອາເມລິກັນລໍຕື່ນນັ້ນຂ້ອຍມັນມັນດອນຖ້າກອງຕອບອາເມລິກັນນັ້ນຊ່ວຍພົດຈົ່ງພົດ
chagrined, seriously chagrined by our defeat in Vietnam. And we were very, but we were very impressed with the brutality of the Khmer Rouge. Pretty soon the Americans find that their enemy's enemy, the Vietnamese enemy, is more or less becoming their friend. In what many viewed as a cynical reversal, the United States began providing aid to the Khmer Rouge. Vietnam must realize that our commitment to a free and independent Cambodia is unswerving. By the 1980s, America's priority in Asia was to support the Chinese, who in turn supported the Khmer Rouge. Despite the desperate need of Cambodian civilians, the United States allied itself with China in blocking United Nations aid to the Vietnamese-supported government in Cambodia. But with the collapse of the Soviet Union in the late 1980s and the end of the Cold War, American foreign policy would change direction once again. As the Vietnamese finally withdrew their troops from Cambodia, the United States withdrew its support for the Khmer Rouge. The group that had once terrorized a nation soon shrank to insignificance. Finally, in 1993, at a cost of $3 billion, the United Nations conducted democratic elections in a devastated nation. Norodom Sihanouk was once again crowned King of Cambodia, a role he had first assumed more than 50 years earlier. In the Cambodian countryside, B-52 bomb craters serve as a reminder of a time when death fell from the sky. It was the beginning of what turned out to be more than three decades of chaos and violence, resulting in a million deaths. As Cambodians seek to rebuild their devastated country, the question remains, can the legacy of those years ever be overcome? To order a home video copy of this program, please call 1-800-440-2651 or write to the address on your screen. Funding for this program was provided by the Australian Film Finance Corporation, the Australian Broadcasting Corporation, Screen West, and the Lotteries Commission of Western Australia. And by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. PBS.